Hello, welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe. It's been a, a very interesting week in the sense that we actually rallied four days in a row, had made back all of the losses from last week. Uh, you'll recall that there was this kind of allegedly North Korea-induced downside volatility at the end of last week. The Dow then went four days in a row up, uh, point-wise being equal to what had been down before. Uh, but then as of today, at least on Thursday, market has uh, gone back the other way a little bit. Um, so anyways, there's, uh, from my vantage point, it's nothing abnormal to have some of this uh, volatility, if, uh, as we've talked about all year. And I don't want to repeat myself ad nauseum, but the lack of volatility is the abnormal thing. But I don't want to spend too much time on that. This particular week's movements in the market are not that totally important to me. One could argue with the difficulties that the Trump administration has had, the self-induced difficulties the Trump administration's had this week, that perhaps we need to be a little more concerned about the prospects of tax reform. I think that's a reasonable uh, question. I, I actually don't happen to agree with it. And this is the thesis that I'm carrying. It's a little contrarian. But I suspect that the challenges the Trump administration are having actually give Congress even more motivation, if not downright necessity, of getting the whole thing done. You'll recall that the votes are essentially there within reason on the um, Republican side of the aisle for what is a mostly universally accepted doctrine regarding a more business-friendly tax structure. And, and of course, within that, there's still some specificity that has to be worked out. But um, I think that if you get to a point uh, from a political standpoint where certain key House Republican races or Senate races feel that they're a little more vulnerable as a result of some of the challenges that the White House is having, it gives them even more motivation, particularly in the aftermath of the inability to handle the Obamacare repeal, to get something done. So from a political standpoint, I don't see um, the, the other side's thesis only sounds good for a second until you think through it. It may be uh, the Trump administration is doing things to become more unpopular and tax reform is something Trump administration wants. Therefore, it would be popular to oppose tax reform. So I get it. It just it, I don't think it has a lot of political logic to it. Ultimately, I think they're going to be able to drive that through. And there's actually some of the brighter policymakers in the White House working on it, as we talked about. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about the, the overall issues with the stock market. But we talked about it last week. I've written quite a bit about it, Dividend Cafe. Um, but it is important when someone in a short-term time horizon, as we find ourselves now, is neither bullish nor bearish, to, to offer some clarity to investors as to what that means and what their positioning around it ought to look like. It means that there's two-sided risk. To the extent that you care about short-term movements, um, you may have an allocation of equities that is appropriate in your long-term planning, but in the short term um, makes you look bad either because you didn't execute on that appropriate long-term allocation and equities went higher and so you missed some of the upside return never to be recovered or the opposite that you did execute upon your long-term allocation equities moved lower after you did so and you're kicking yourself that if you had timed it better you would have found a more attractive entry point so we could uh, establish empirically without any effort whatsoever that those short-term timing risks are immaterial in the concept, uh, in the context rather of long-term um, investment goals and um, proper asset allocating of one's uh, portfolio. But let me take it a step further. Um, we believe that the argument right now uh, in, in terms of short-term concerns for markets is a specious one, but it's reasonable that, that valuations are high they're high in some aspects of the market. They're not high in others. Um, as far as the whole broad market goes, there's some metrics by which the broad market is high. For example, market valuation as a percentage of GDP is at a very high level. And then others where it isn't very high, market uh, valuation based on price to earnings ratio, PE, is high but not unreasonably high. And then there's somewhere it's downright cheap, and that is market valuation, or the earnings of the S&P divided by market value relative to the bond yield. Any comparison one uses, which the Fed is very fond of, by the way, 
that compares equity values to bond values is not going to come up with this big short-term red flag. So when you have three different ways to approach it, one is concerning, one is positive, and the other one is median. You end up kind of with a median perspective on those sorts of things. But um, I believe we've made the point rather persuasively this year that valuation, uh, to the extent it's relevant, is never relevant as a timing tool, uh, more just in terms of a longer term expe expected rate of return for a given asset class. Um, so I do believe that there is a prudence and a discipline around resisting some of those calls. But with that said, if we were to be tactical about things right now, um, we certainly have had periods in our careers as asset allocators that we've been very aggressive about wanting to put money into the equity markets when we thought that uh, regardless of timing their turnaround, they were extremely cheap. And we've had periods uh, where we felt the opposite. And we've hugged the more conservative side of our client's strategic asset allocations for some time. But we do believe that there is a selectivity. Uh, we, we entered 2017 with the same exact belief. There's an inherent benefit in selectivity right now because you're not necessarily seeing something where the entire market is um, stretched in terms of valuation. There's key parts. And so we think that one could, within the context of their equity allocation that meets their risk reward criteria um, in the context of their planning and so forth that we do, we believe that you could bucket that equity allocation selectively. And that's that's what we're uh, big believers in at the Bonson Group. And we think that a lot of that bucketing, so to speak, or targeting or selecting, discerning uh, value-oriented names um, will help to mitigate some of that risk. Uh, we put a chart in DividendCafe.com this week uh, in the periods of really elevated volatility where the higher quality companies financially, as measured by their actual credit quality, uh, perform. But by the way, they go down. They just go down a real small fraction historically of what the lower credit rated um, organizations in the S&P 500 go down. So there is a defensive benefit, not to mention a sort of permanent quality benefit around cash flows, around balance sheet, around perhaps a moat in one's business. What you do miss out on, though, is some of the real attractive, aggressive momentum growth that could take place in those types of companies. But that uh, bias towards higher quality is one that we think is permanent and then particularly tactical in this uh, given environment. So uh, with that said, the uh, position we have about equity markets right now is that there is absolutely no reason to be running for the hills. There's no reason to be loading up, but rather to stay within one's conscious, intentional, and thoughtful asset allocation. Um, what do we worry about as far as big events? Do we think that we can go to nuclear war with North Korea? We do not. Uh, do we think that China could disrupt the global economy? We do, but uh, you will note that for 18 months now, China has been a net positive to global economic conditions, not a negative. So overall, we would view um, the, the risk, uh, what we call tail risk, the big event type thing. Uh, uh, recession is a ways off uh, by our modeling and forecasting. And frankly, um, we think that there's a lot of tremendous opportunity in some of the sectors of the market. And, and I'm very, very willing to have, be patient, but I think that there's going to be money to be made on some of the energy names that are most defeated and some of the lower valuation names across a number of sectors. But bottom-up companies as opposed to, to trying to come into the entire market. So this is, a, this is an important call for active management at this juncture, uh, we think. Um, there's so many things to DividendCafe.com this week. We'd really love for you to check it out. I think it's one of the better ones in terms of readability, understandability, and, and hopefully valuable information. So with that said, we'll leave it here. We encourage you to watch this video week by week, sign up for that, read DividendCafe.com as much as you like. Those of you into podcasts, hopefully know we have that as well. We're trying to, to present to you as much content in as many different forms as we can because we so earnestly desire your education and development as an investor. And more than anything else, for those of you that are clients, we sure do appreciate the privilege of working on your behalf. And we welcome your questions, comments, anytime. Thanks so much for listening. Dividend Cafe.